Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, outer space. 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 Hope you enjoy. Story number one, Earn It, written by Haina. Since the beginning, our mother has been there for us. She was not always loving, caring, and nurturing, although she had her moments. From her cradle we began our ascension, though the road was long and treacherous. Our mother is to blame for this, but we do not fault her for it, either. She looked to us in our infancy and saw an ember, a desire that smoldered inside of us, and so she did her best to fan that spark to flame. As we grew, we slowly began to hear the song our mother was singing to us. In her storms, her fires, floods, and disasters, we saw the harsh reality that would be mirrored throughout our future. In the gentle rains, the warm sunlight, we saw the gentle, nurturing aspect that only came but once in a while. At first, we grew angry at our mother. How could she visit upon us, her favored children, these horrific disasters? We raged and thrashed, building our walls, stubborn as the earth beneath our feet. It was not for many years that we realized that we were not her favored children. We were simply the most promising ones this time around. In the deaths of our kind, we heard our mother speak. You show great potential, she would say, and you are destined for great things, but you must earn it, for the universe will not hand you what you desire. I will make you as the earth, unrelenting, sturdy, and yet still easily adaptable, despite all your bullheadedness. Content in our knowledge, we continued that same path, stubbornly meeting every challenge our mother threw at us head-on. Former predators domesticated or caged, diseases banished or made irrelevant. Soon enough, we were the new kings. We walked on the earth like tiny gods, shaping the land to our will. With our planet, our mother tamed, we looked for new challenges, new skies, and so... We turned our eyes to the heavens. Bursting forth from our cradle, we took the heavens in force, spreading to the stars. When we looked out in that cold, inky blackness, the void looked down on us. It spoke in the harsh, uncaring terms of something far beyond complete understanding. To us, humanity had said, You are a drop in the sea of time. I will swallow you whole, as I have... So many before you. You are nothing to something such as I. Here, you will meet your end. At first, we were disheartened, for those words held truth. We were finite. In the end, we would return to the dust from whence we came. We turned our eyes back to the pale blue marble, our mother, who had given birth to us. We remembered her lessons, though they had lost their sting as of late. Looking back to the void, we smiled. That is true, we spoke, in our harsh, uncaring terms of creatures who cared little for fate. But you will have to earn it. End of story. Story number three. The Weapon, written by Damaged Dice DM. The Chlorates were a conquest species, traveling from one planet to the next, leaving a path of devastation in their wake. They achieved this through their use of powerful hydrogen-based weapons. They were a feat of twisted ingenuity. The weapon spread the payload over a wide area, able to effectively cover a large portion of a planet in a single attack. Some sick bastard had come up with the idea to chemically bond oxygen to hydrogen to allow it to stick to the surface burning them more effectively and outright exploding any living thing it touched. They deployed it in its molten form to be more effective, showering the target planet in a spray of trillions of droplets, each capable of bringing death. They approached planet 27465-53X3 and intercepted unencrypted radio signals and were able to ascertain the inhabitants called the planet Earth. They parked their destroyers in orbit and transmitted an ultimatum. Surrender or suffer the wrath of the Chlorates. They gave the Earthians one standard galactic date to decide. From the design of their timekeeping system, they understood this to be about 15 minutes in their time. 
No response. Fine. It was decided that a show of force would make them more compelled to surrender. They selected a target at a large populated area on the higher side of the equator, centered on one area they call London. They released the weapon, watched as it descended through the atmosphere to doom all below. One of the technicians on board was able to bring up the planetside news broadcasts from the area. They turned in only to find the weapon must have traveled to the surface much faster than anticipated, because the screen showed the landscape absolutely covered in the weapon. But the humans didn't even seem to notice it. Many seemed to have devised defenses to it in the short time that they had been allotted to surrender. Strange, deployable shields they gave off a black opaque aura that seemed to emit from a small device held in their hands. Others taunted them for going even this insane attempt to escape the weapon, mocking them. A tiny one in bright yellow garb with the matching foot coverings jumped into a large pool of it that had collected on the surface they were walking on in open defiance of their oppression. That's when they noticed hundreds of inbound projectiles approaching their ship from the surface. They took evasive maneuvers, but the entire fleet was hit by at least one of these devices. The large ships lost power and began to sink into the atmosphere. The ships crashed towards the surface. Some exploded but air. Some made it to the ground before exploding. Several days later, a scientist delivered a report to an army general in charge of sorting out what happened. Flipping through, he exclaimed, I don't know what any of this means. Give me the cliff notes. The scientist cleared his throat and spoke. Well, uh, it appears that uh, there are sodium-based life forms. Water l l literally makes them explode. End of story. Story number three. Sticks and Stones. Written by Dragonson04. Scientific Log 154-423. Head Researcher Fu'u Niu. We thought from the beginning that this would be easy. Isolate and capture a few advanced sentient specimens from a death world, along with the native plants, lesser animals, along with metals and minerals for study on a neutral study platform, usually a moon orbiting a gas giant. A long-used practice amongst my people, the Vorkal. We were very curious about the galaxy and our place in it. Being reptilian, we were always fascinated with avian, ichthyoid, and amphibian races. But mammalian, now there was a type of race we knew little about. I wish we had never been so curious. These humans were unlike any mammalian species that we'd even heard of. See attached file labeled Human Anatomy for more. Most mammals in the galaxy at large weren't evolved to the level of humanity. Still stuck in their birth world due to lack of FTL travel. They seemed to be perfect for our purposes. We took the plants, minerals, and lesser animals several of their solar cycles before the experiment began, to make sure the test area was suitable for the experiment. Among the plants we took, there was one that grew incredibly fast. This bamboo can apparently grow anywhere on the human birth world, from the driest and hottest to the coldest and wettest, and at any altitude. It took to the environment we provided with an almost childlike hunger. A full quarter of the moon was covered in a bamboo forest within five of the solar cycles. Remarkable. We didn't know that at the time, but the artificial gravity was slightly lighter than their world, but for us, it was within acceptable margin of error. Perhaps that helped the bamboo, and what would come later. One of the metals, known to the humans as iron, was largely left out to oxidize. We thought that it was beneath their notice, being such a simple thing. When the experiment began, the humans were told of their situation, what was available, and were told to act naturally and survive. We had a small cloaked facility on the moon to oversee the whole thing, as to not greatly interfere with the results, and we made sure they didn't know where it was, all of that led up to what will be remembered as mistake number one. They took longer than expected to settle down and establish a leader, but they chose a former member of one of their nation-state's militaries, Australia, if memory serves. That will be remembered as mistake number two. 
Within one of their weeks, they had already established a very primitive fortress made out of void-cursed bamboo, walls, separate housing for males and females, and communal area in the middle with very, very large fire pit. Proper distance for a waste area called a latrine, and a regular patrols on the hunting parties for the animals that we had brought. Each male and female amongst them had been armed with an iron-tipped bamboo spear. I distinctly remember thinking, Spears? How primitive are these humans? We didn't know. How could we have known that, other than their own limbs, spears were among their oldest weapons? Prehistorically ancient. That telling humans of a mammalian species to survive and act naturally would lead to the total destruction of the facility on that moon. We were completely unprepared for the ferocity and bloodlust. Every single failsafe we could use to stop a failed experiment didn't work at all. They called our most toxic gases either delightfully minty and refreshing or, oh, smells like my mom's chili Colorado, whatever that means. The liquid option. They drank it and actually thanked us for fresh water. In hindsight, that should have been expected from a species from a death world. A great oversight on our part. In summary, it is better to observe humans on their own cursed world of a planet, as to attempt to observe them in a neutral environment with even slightly lesser gravity will result in the destruction of billions worth of investment in infrastructure and scientific equipment. All of our advanced science, and they destroyed us with little more than a sense of community, being armed with nothing but sticks and stones. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Lord Azrakul, and Arcadian. 